Hello and welcome to Double Play Sports. I'm James alongside Pat. Uh, today we are here with a very exclusive interview with former MLB All-Star and World Series champ, Mike the Hitman Eastler. Mike, how you doing today? I'm doing fine, James. Everybody's good. Everybody's good. We're just taking it one day at a time and just trying to stay safe, you know, just trying to stay safe around here. Yeah, things are kind of chaotic right now. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. But we'll get through it. Yeah. So first question I have is you grew up in Ohio in the 1950s and 60s. Did you face a lot of difficulties playing baseball at a young age? You know, I did at first, um, but my dad introduced me to the game at a very young age. Matter of fact, I used to walk maybe three to four miles every day for practice because my father worked two jobs and he worked with the post office and he worked another job after that. So a lot of times I had to hitchhike to practice <laughs> from my house in Cleveland. But um, somehow, some way, I made it, and um, it was a little difficult. But I was, I was determined to make it. So therefore, I wasn't gonna let nothing stop me. All right. Yeah. At what age did you kind of realize, like, you were gonna be an MLB player? This is what you were gonna do. I'm gonna put all my time and work into that. Well, you know, once I hit high school, I went to a Catholic high school there in Cleveland, Benedictine High School. And I knew that that was a very, very um, competitive high school and you know, really known for sports in Cleveland. So I think once I got to high school, I said, I'm determined to try to get a scout to see me. So hopefully I could get drafted, you know, you know, to play um, a, a, a professional baseball. So when you were drafted, you were drafted in the 14th round of the 1969 draft. Now, a lot of 14th rounders aren't given much of a chance and rarely ever make it. How much work and effort and resistance did it take to really make it? Well, you, you, you know, you read it exactly right. Um, a lot of times I was looked over. Uh, matter of fact, I spent 10 years in the minor leagues before I made it to the major leagues. Plus, during that 10 years in the minor leagues, I played 10 years of winter baseball. So I was actually going nonstop for 10 years. I went to Mexico for six winners, Venezuela for three winners, and Panama for um, another winner. So I put a lot of time in. A lot of time they did look over me and they did pass me over, but I just stick with it. I was tenacious. I was not going to quit. And eventually I got my, you know, my break to stay in 1979. Yeah, yeah. So we are currently in the MLB off season and you were traded in your career eight times. Do you have any <laughs> advice? That's nothing against you. I think that means they were all after you. Uh, what advice do you give to players right now who are looking at getting traded? Well, let me tell you something. When you're traded, that means somebody wants you. That means somebody, you know, your talents are needed and they recognize that you do have talent and you're going to fit into their scheme of things, you know. A lot of clubs may not need it, you know, like Houston had a stacked outfield when I was coming up. Houston had um, Bob Watson in left field, Cesar Cedeno in center field, uh, Jose Cruz in right, Willie Crawford, um, 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 Jesus Alou. I mean, I'm talking about some players that were really, really good players. But um, I just didn't care. Anytime I got traded, I said, well, I'm going to just go there and do my job, do my thing. And eventually it worked out when I got traded to the Pirates in 1977. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what was life really like in the minor leagues? Because you hear all these stories about how awful it is even today. I, I couldn't imagine what it must have been like almost 50 years ago. Well, it was tough. Matter of fact, um, my wife used to tell me I survived on potato chips and um, and uh, honey buns, <laughs> you know, and then got Cokes and, you know, at the store. We went to a lot of uh, hamburger places. Um, what do you call it? The little hamburger place, the little small hamburger, the little square hot hamburgers. Yeah. I can't think of the name of it. But, um, I mean, we just had to do what we had to do, and uh, we made it the best we could. Matter of fact, I got married my third year in the minor league baseball, so it was tough for me and my wife. But we stuck together, and we hung it out. It was tough, riding the bus trips, you know, mail money, maybe about $10 a day, $12 a day. Um, we lived uh, – three or four, you know, when I first started, we lived about three or four to, to an apartment. So we had to just save money and do what we had to do, but we were determined to make it. Now, uh, in 1979, in that World Series with the Pirates, your team was down three to one in the series against the Orioles. 
when that was happening, what was what was the general attitude? What did what did it feel like? Well, that's another good question because a lot of times people, um, a lot of fans, different people gave up on us. Billy Stargell, our leader, Dave Parker, our quiet leader. When I say quiet leader, leader in the clubhouse, he wasn't quiet at all. But um, we just had a bunch of guys, a bunch of veteran guys who believed in themselves. And um, Willie used to say, hey, look, our back's against the wall. There's no else to turn but win. We just got to go out there and win. Matter of fact, when that day we were down three to one, we were in um, in Pittsburgh, and Chuck Tanner the night before lost his uh, mother the night before, that Saturday night. And we had a Sunday game against Baltimore, down three to one. Chuck Tanner came in and gave a speech about his mother passing, but he was saying that she would want him to, you know, to continue managing the team and do what he had to do. And uh, we went up and won that game that Sunday. We had an off day Monday. We went back to Baltimore, won that game Tuesday. And we came back on the last day, and we just put a whooping on them after that. And we, we came back from, um, you know, from um, th- um, three games to one. Yeah. So after you won in 1979, you guys came back and won. Was that just kind of like an electric feeling? That was one of the greatest feelings you could ever imagine in life. I, and that was my rookie year, mind you. And yeah. I was basically, I only started three games that year, so I was basically a cheerleader slash pinch hitter. So I just had, I just sat there and observed what it started with Dave Parker, Bill Madlock, um, 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 Phil Garner, um, Bill Robinson, John Milner, Omar Moreno. I just said John Candelaria, Kent DeColby, all them guys just go out there and we were just, we were just winning. We had a winning attitude. We were together, and we really never gave up. Never gave up. We never quit, and it turned out to be great for it. But we just had that no quit attitude, and that's what I loved about the Pirates that year. Yeah. So very soon after this, you earned the Pirates' job and left uh, the starting job. In 1980, you hit 338, hitting 21 homers and driving in 74 runs. So how did you kind of? handle the newfound fame as kind of a superstar in Pittsburgh? Well, what happened is they finally gave me a chance to play. I got to start in Baltimore. I mean, not Baltimore, Montreal. And once I hit, I got a chance to play my first game. I think I had to be, I don't think I went four for five that day with two home runs against Scott Sanderson in Montreal. So Sanderson said, well, let me give him another shot, another game to start. So I started another game, two for three, then I three for four, two for three, two for three. I just got my chance, finally, after all them years, 1980, I finally got a chance to play on the, on the daily basis against righties and lefties, and I ended up with a pretty good year, 338. So on June 12th in 1980, uh, you hit for the cycle. Was, was that the favorite moment of your career? It can be right up there, really close, really, really, really close. I think my favorite moment was the being nominated or being elected to the 1981 All-Star Game, and that was in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. But other than that, the World Series was the next highest after after the All-Star Game, and I believe that hitting for the cycle was the third on my list of being the most exciting moments. That was a great game. I got the triple. I think I got the triple the first at bat. Then I got a double. Then I got a broken bat single. And then the last at bat, I hit the home run up in the upper deck in Cincinnati. And that was, I was elated. As a matter of fact, my mom called me in the clubhouse and said, congratulations, congratulations, you hit for the cycle. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, great. Yeah, so. Really like, quick. Was- really quick, James, really quick. Before we move on to the next question, I have a follow-up about that game. Were you at the cycle? Um, what was it like going into that last at bat, knowing that you could possibly hit for the cycle and the one you needed was the home run? You know, it's funny. Um, it's funny that you're pointing that out. When I joined the Red Sox, I had a chance to talk with Ted Williams. Ted Williams talked a lot about hitting. Everybody knows he was the greatest hitter that ever lived. And he told me, Mike, what's your philosophy on hitting when you're ahead of the count. I said, well, I just try to get a fastball and get the bat head out on it and just hit it hard. Ted Williams said, look, when you know a fastball is coming, I want you to get up there and just cock your hips a little bit open. Cock them open, and then your bat head will follow after. So I said, God, that's a pull hitter. I'm not a pull hitter because I hit the ball to all fields. 
But on that one time, I tried what Ted Williams told me. The count was 2-0. and Doug Bear was pitching. He threw hard, threw about 93-94. Fastball right over the top. Ball one, ball two. I said to myself, all right, Ted Williams, let me see if your theory works. So 2-0, and all, I got up the bat. I kind of opened my hips up a little bit prematurely. And when the ball came, it was a high fastball. Bam! I caught it right out front. And that's when I hit up on the top. I knew I was aware that I needed to cycle. And uh, on that on that exact pitch, two and zero, what Ted Williams told me to do, I did, and it worked. Wow! So, like you said, in uh, '81, you were named to the National League All Star team. Did you make a lot of strong relationships and good friendships with some of the teammates? Well, let me tell you something. When you when I walked into the clubhouse, Pete Rose, Mike Smith. Steve Carlton, Dusty Baker, Ron Say, I mean, I could go Dave Parker, Andre Dawson. I mean, the great of the greatest, by the blue. Um, all the great players on every club. I mean, that was like heaven. I mean, just to make the major leagues is heaven, you know, and you're excited. But then to play in an all-star game with the greatest of greats, I think in that ball club, in that all-star game, I think we had 18 Hall of Famers that played in the 81 All-Star game. You could do your homework later and check it. But I think it was almost 18 Hall of Famers that played in that game in 1981. But Dallas Green was the manager, and he picked me as an extra outfielder because I used to kind of hit the Phillies pretty good. You know, when we played the Phillies, I kind of had luck against them, and I hit the ball real hard. So Dallas Green told me, Mike, you deserve it. He said, you, you know, 1980, you hit 337, I mean, I mean 338. And he said, you just killed the Phillies. So, Dallas Green picked me as an extra outfielder, but as I said, there was like 18 Hall of Famers on American and National League that um, that ended up in the World Series. I mean, in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So during your peak years, and I got right here special Mike Eastwood <laughs> baseball card. There so, you go. There you go. Yeah. During your peak years, you were averaging hitting almost 300 with over 15 homers and around 70 RBIs a year. How did you sustain your very high level of play? There's one thing about baseball, and I was talking to uh, some kids. I do, I still do training, training here in Las Vegas, hitters, to keep your intensity and focus day after day after day, especially at a professional level. Not an easy thing, but I believe I was blessed with talent to play, talent to hit, but I had a great work ethic. You know, I worked hard. I, I, every day I just tried to put some time in, you know, to improve my skills of hitting, maybe hit the breaking ball. And, you know, staying on the fastball, laying off certain pitches in certain areas. I just, every time I took the field, I just wanted to be my best. I just wanted to be at my best. And most hitters who are, who are successful, they take a lot of pride in what they do. They never, um, never become satisfied. You're always trying to learn something about the game. You know, and uh, I had some great teammates and Willie Stargell, Jim Rice, um, you know, Wade Boggs, I had Don Madley, Dave Winfield that I played with that always kept my game at a high level, and I used to pick their brains to make sure that I stayed on top of my game. That's funny you say that. Our next question is about some of those great teammates, including those guys, as you said, and a guy like Willie Stargell, as we mentioned when we were talking about the World Series. What was it like having those guys in the clubhouse? How much of a presence were they? Let me tell you, they are the – that was the most important part – I believe Willie Stargell was really one of the main reasons that I was successful for longevity once I got there, stayed there another 10 plus years, because Willie taught me mentally how to approach a game, mentally how to practice, how to accept failure, how to accept success. All these things are very important, never too high, never too low. Uh, he taught me sometimes you hit not off what the pitcher's throwing, if, uh, it, you know, you hit off the catcher sometimes because the catcher is going to call a different game with guys in scoring position opposed to nobody on base. Or according to the score of the game, the pitcher will pitch you different. And Willie knew a lot of them better in pitchers, so he used to tell me, Mike, they're going to throw this. They're going to do this. Watch for this. Watch for that. And uh, Willie Stargell was just the best. He, he he was the greatest. As a matter of fact, he was my mentor. And um, I, I really owe a lot to my career to Willie Stargell. So we have here that you finished uh, your playing career in the Japanese Pacific League. 
Um, yes, the Nippon what, what was that, like? that was a yeah, whole how, different how, experience. How, it was a whole different experience, but it was a great experience. And I'm so glad that I got a chance to finish my career. I believe I was like 37, 38 years old at the time. And uh, I knew I knew my career was winding down, but I still had a little pop in my back. I still could hit a little bit. So I went over there in DH for two years, played occasionally first base. But it, they approach the game a little bit different than we do. They're more low key. They do a lot of bunny. They do a lot of small ball in Japan. And when I went over there my first year, they were just like elated because I ended up hitting 19 home runs in 99 games. And they couldn't believe it. It was a great, great. And I learned a whole lot about baseball and hitting. All right, yes. Yeah, so. I, I have one more question, Jim. Yeah. Um, who, for you, who's the toughest pitcher that you ever faced? <laughs> Another good question. <laughs> um, I believe... The toughest pitcher that kind of got me kind of confused and mixed up, number one was Phil Necro, Atlanta Braves. He threw knuckleball. But he threw about three or four different speeds on his knuckleball. And he had great control with it, so you couldn't take pitches hoping to walk because he threw the ball in the strike zone. It was wobbly and off the ball. It was crazy hitting Phil Necro. My second toughest pitcher, I believe, was Jack Morris, another Hall of Famer. He, he, he got in there a little late. Jack Moore is one of the toughest pitchers. He had a weird delivery over the top. He had a good fastball, 90 plus. He had a good um, slider, nasty. He used to put it anywhere he wants to. Um, and he had a split finger fastball. They don't throw it that much in a split finger. It's a hard, it's, it's really a hard knuckleball. That's what it is. So Jack Morris and um, and Phil Necro was two of my toughest pitchers that I faced. Yeah, of course, Phil Necro, probably the greatest knuckleballer of all time, and Jack Moore, oh, yeah. probably the greatest Tigers pitcher of all time. So after after your playing days, you spent six seasons with four different teams as a major league hitting coach and a lot of other seasons as minor league coaches. Were there any notable players or any other players that you formed a really like a special bond with in that role? Well... The, the guy that I work with until this day, Mo Vaughn, the Boston Red Sox. Mo Vaughn has a baseball academy in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, called Vaughn Sports Academy. So I fly in and out to Boca to work with him, to work with hitters in his academy. And eventually we're going to start working with major league players out of the academy. It's just a matter of time. Right now we're doing mostly young kids. Mo Vaughn has a, a son that's eight years old. And, and last time I left there, his eight-year-old son hit a home run over the fence, 200 feet fence, eight years old, about 85 pounds. And um, Mo wants me to teach him like I taught him. I said, Mo, he's eight years old. He said, no, I don't care. Teach him. <laughs> so I have a great relationship with Mo Vine. Um, but when I was a uh, hitting coach with Mo, I mean, then I went on to Milwaukee. Pat Listash was rookie of the year under me. And Dante Bichette, Bo Bichette's um, dad, he, he turned out to be a pretty good hitter in his own right when he got traded to Colorado. And then I had um, I had a lot of guys that, okay, then I got with the Dodgers in the minor leagues, Groven, and I had a half a year in the big leagues with them, Matt Kemp, James Loney. Um, I, I, you know, just a lot of guys. And over the years, you just spend a lot of time with these guys in the batting cage. You get to know them, and you wish them nothing but success. But the closest relationship I had with my former player that I coached was um, – with Mo Bond. Plus, in St. Louis, I had Jim Edmonds and um, Fernando Tatis. His dad, Junior's dad, he hit the two home runs, two grand slams in one inning, and um, Mark McGuire, mind you. And I had Mark McGuire there. The year I got there, he hit 65 home runs. He hit 70 the year before. So I had a chance to be around some great, great, great hitters, and um, I loved every bit of it. 